There are three major structures of the church. There is the organic structure, there is the administrative structure, and there's the operational structure. So the organic structure speaks of the oneness of the church. So the church is one body. And there are levels of oneness. I give you three levels of oneness very quickly. Organically speaking, there is what we call oneness in the spirit. You know the Bible said, by one spirit you are baptized into what? One body. And then Hebrews 12, 22, 24, it said, you've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to an innumerable company of angels, to the spirit of just men made perfect, to the church of the firstborn, and all of that. So there is a place where we are one in the spirit. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15, it said, for this cause I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So there is an organic dimension to the church where we are one. We are so one that... You are me, I am you. Because it's the same Holy Ghost that is in you that is in me. The second level of oneness is oneness in faith. We believe one thing. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. Beginning from verse 4 exactly. It said, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, teach you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. It said, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, for bearing one another in love. Verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. From verse 4. They said there's one body, one spirit, one hope of one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and is in all. So he's the same God above all, through all and in all. So we are one in faith. It's what you believe that I believe. That's why we can't be different. So apart from the fact that we are one in spirit, we are also one in faith. And we are not only one in faith, we are also one in doctrine. That's why you and I believe that a virgin gave birth to Jesus. That's why you and I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's why you and I believe that Jesus died for our sins. That's why you and I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. That's why you and I believe that we have salvation. That's why you and I believe we have the Holy Spirit. That's why you and I believe that at the end of time, we will rejoice and live with God forever in the next. So we have one doctrine, we have one faith, and we are one in the spirit. This is why we must hold tight to our oneness. Because our greatest advantage lies in our oneness. Let me show you four things about our unity. Number one, the danger of this unity is that it makes us powerless and impotent. In Mark 3.25, Jesus said, a house divided against itself and not stand. And that's where the devil is going. And what the devil is using to fuel this disunity is our ego, our pride, our bitterness, our competitiveness, our arrogance born from knowledge is what is pushing this. So we are pressing and we don't care about the impact it has on the body of Christ. Every time we try to bring order and there is excessive contention, know that pride has entered. Proverbs 13, 10 said, every contention comes from pride. And when contention and strife come, evil has entered. James 3, 16, it says where there is strife, it says all evil dwell there. And when we allow this evil enter, we become powerless. So the authority that we should wield from the place of corporate existence, we lose it. Now, is it right to speak for truth, to correct errors? Yes, the spirit of Christ necessitates it. In Titus 1 verse 5, it says, For this cause I left you in Crete, that you might set in order the things that are lacking. In Jude verse 3 and 4, Jude was speaking, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you about the common salvation, it said, It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to us. Why? Next verse, it said, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who before of old were ordained unto condemnation. They say ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the Lord Jesus. So there are evil men who come to take advantage of our heritage. So there is need. Paul was speaking in Philippians chapter 1 verse 7. He spoke about his defense and confirmation of the gospel. So there is a place for bringing rebuke. There's a place for bringing correction. You cannot say there should be no correction in the body of Christ. Excesses, we overrun our value system. So there is a place. If there's no place, the heritage of God will be sabotaged. However, there are laws that we must pay attention to so that we don't destroy the strength of our unity. The first law is the law of caution. Every time you want to bring correction, especially to the body of Christ, 
and you do it without caution, you will cause more harm than good. And let me show you a few areas of caution. Number one, Jesus cautions us against pride. Romans 14 verse 4. He said, who art thou that judges another man's servant? He said to his own master, his standard of fallen. He said, yea, he shall hold in him up. For God is able to make him stand. You know what Jesus is saying here? Most times when we try to correct people, it's because we feel we are bigger. That's why the question is, who do you think you are? So it's right to correct. He said, but there must be caution not to let pride come in. There's another caution. It's the caution against self-righteousness. Sometimes when we want to correct people, the devil makes us feel we are now the standard, not Jesus. And we begin to project self-righteousness. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 to 5. It says, judge not that ye be not judged. It says, for with what judgment you judge, ye shall be judged. And what measure you meet out shall be measured unto you again. And why beholdest thou the moth? that is in thy brother's eye, but considered not. You see what Jesus is saying? The beam in your own eye. Jesus is saying your own is a log. So he said every time you become overzealous about rebuking others, correcting others, pointing their error, he say you will always forget about your own. So it will become a disposition of self-righteousness. Does this mean we shouldn't correct? No, but there's a caution so that you don't drift to the extreme of self-righteousness where you see only the error in others and you don't see error in yourself. And most times people who make it a lifestyle to keep correcting people, when you come around what they are doing, is littered with a lot of error. But they can't see it anymore because their eyes become blocked. The third caution is caution against bitterness that might result in a harsh judgment for you. That's why it said in Matthew 7 verse 2, he said, the way you judge other people, that's how you also be judged. So when we are correcting people, we must be careful to allow room for mercy. If you look at the story of the woman that was caught in adultery, in John chapter 8, verse 7 to 9, Jesus showed up. He didn't endorse it. Correction is good. Judgment is good. He said, but the person who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. All of them ran away. <laughs> because if you do, God will show you your own judgment. So while we are trying to bring order to the church, which is correct, which is right, we must be careful. Most of you who are here, you see that we bring correction on a lot of things, from kingdom finance, tithing and all of that, to lascivious living, to erroneous type of prayer. We do it. What I'm doing now in itself is a kind of correction. But there must be a place of caution for pride not to enter, for self-righteousness to enter, and for bitterness and wickedness not to enter. Because if these things enter, you will be setting yourself up for a more difficult judgment. The second thing you must know when you are treading this corridor is what gives you authority to speak. Not everybody has authority to speak because the Bible gives us recommendations and credentials of how to speak. Number one, for you to speak, you must know the truth and the absolute truth. If you don't know the exact truth, and the context in which a reality took place, but you know something halfway, you now jump up and you condemn another person. You are in trouble because that your judgment will not be just. So before you deal with any matter, make sure yourself is in position or possession of the truth. Ephesians 4.15 says, speaking the truth. That means you must have the truth to speak it. The second credential is love. You can't correct anybody if it is not done in love. And if it is done in love, number one, you must have prayed for that person. Number two, you must have used every means possible to reach that person, to bring that person to the right way so that he learns it. It's when you can't achieve that, that you can now discuss it in a platform like this. And your focus must not be to condemn that person. Your focus must be to present it in a way that when he hears, it will give the Holy Ghost opportunity to talk to his heart so that he is recovered. If what we do ends up destroying people and not restoring them, it means it's not done in love. The Bible says speaking the truth in love. If the truth is spoken in love, it will raise people. It won't break them. Number three credential for those who have the authority to speak is that your words must be full of grace. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6. It says let your words be seasoned with salt and be saturated with grace. If what you are saying comes with too much bitterness, ego, pride, competitiveness, which people can discern. Listen, 
Everybody has basic discernment. As I'm talking now, if I'm referring to somebody, everybody will know. And if I'm saying it to paint the person in a bad light, everybody will know. If I'm saying it to discredit the person's ministry, everybody will know. So before we say we want to bring truth, it should be designed first to help those who are under them so that they are not lost. And secondly, is to give them opportunity for a turnaround. This is why our words must be filled with truth, with grace. He said, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. So there is the credential for grace in our words. And then number four, it must be with humility. When you are addressing people, you must not take the position of Lord and Master. We must know there is a difference between the correction of Jesus and the correction of the apostles. Jesus is the owner of the church. Every other person is a member of the church. So you can't come and be addressing people as if you are the Lord and master. If you don't do it with humility, you have missed it because you can't help anybody. At the end of the day, you will rather cause chaos in the body of Christ. And remember, we are saying what we are saying here in the context of oneness and unity. And I'm saying correction is important because unity does not mean we should endorse error. Unity does not mean we should ad accept wolves in sheep clothing. There's a place of shielding the believers. And there's a place of correcting those in error so that they are restored without compromising the standards that define who we are. This is why these credentials are important. And finally, when you are correcting people, you do it with boldness. Don't be intimidated. So long as your motives are pure, so long as you are doing it in law, so long as there is grace in your words, so long as you are doing it with humility, and so long as you have access to the truth, be bold about it. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, when the disciples prayed, verse 29, 30, they said that he may grant boldness that they may declare the word of God. So speak it with boldness. Don't be afraid. It is said that a pure conscience hears no accusation. So be bold and share it. But make sure that you have these credentials. Don't just wake up and feel, oh, I, I, I want to correct this error. I want to correct this error. Yourself will fall into error faster than you will know it. Except, as number one, you have exercised all the biblical cautions there is to exercise and that you have the credential to talk, which is having truth, having humility. Your words are seasoned with grace, speaking the truth in love. And then there is boldness in your communication. The fourth thing you must consider around this corridor is that correction must be done according to biblical injunctions or biblical prescription. There is a way things were corrected in the Bible and you cannot bring your own correction in a way that is different from that. See one of the, the tricks the devil uses. If somebody is in error and you don't do it the Bible way, you know what you do? you will turn that person to become the victim. And instead of revealing that error so that people can be saved, people will rather gravitate towards that person who is in error because the larger community is sentimental. That's why most of the people that we are trying to stop their oppression because of falsehood, we have now turned them to victims and their members now hold them stronger because instead of seeing their error, they think we are fighting them. So the people you want to help, you have actually made them to become victims a thousand times. Because as far as they are concerned, you are not about truth. You are jealous of their pastor. You are angry with their pastor. You are competing with their pastor. So they will do everything humanly possible to fight to defend their pastor. Now the church has become the church in Corinth. Yes, some say I belong to Apollos. Some say I belong to Paul. Some say I belong to Cephas. Because we want to bring truth and we are not exercising caution. Let me show you five biblical patterns for bringing truth and sustaining unity at the same time. Number one, every time truth was brought publicly in the Bible, go and read your scripture, it was brought to the disciples of the one communicating it. There are five things you will see here. The first is that it is disciples that corrected disciples publicly. That's the first thing you will find in your Bible. And it is replete. Colossians 4.12, say unto Archippus to give heed to the ministry that he has received on the Lord of the Lord. Second Timothy 4:10. Demas has forsaken me because he loved this present world. Paul had the authority to correct them publicly. They were his disciples. So he had jurisdiction. There's no way that can cause controversy or division in the body of Christ because there was jurisdiction for that. The second thing you will see about publicly correcting falsehood or bringing truth is that 
people were corrected when they attended the service of the one doing the correction. That's when you can say it the way you want because they came to you. Matthew 3, 7, when the Pharisees came to the baptismal service of John the Baptist, he looked at them and he said, you brood of vipers. Who told you that you can escape the judgment that is to come? They came to his meeting. And most times when they come, they come to create confusion. So he had the authority to do that. Most times when you talk about correcting people, people start quoting Paul, corrected Peter in the church in Galatia. Where were they? Was Paul talking to Peter in Jerusalem? It was when Peter came to the congregation where Paul was in Galatia and acted hypocritically that Paul rebuked him. And it ended there. Paul didn't go to preach in another location and say there's one apostle who say he's a senior apostle from Jerusalem. He's a hypocrite. If he does that, it will cause problem in the body of Christ. And he spoke to Peter face to face. In our generation today, people who have opportunity to meet themselves can't tell themselves truth. We now go back and hide behind our pulpit and we are throwing arrows from, that's cowardice. If you have not met the person, it's a different thing. How can you talk to somebody on phone? You meet somebody face to face. You didn't raise one issue. Those of you who are students of church history, you knew the argument that took place between Martin Luther and Zwilinji about and a baptism, the baptism of children. They argued it out. Not that you, you meet somebody, you don't have the boldness to tell him the truth. You speak to somebody, you can't tell him the truth. When your relationship now strains, you now come to the altar. Everybody start talking. And gullible followers who can discern, think this is the word of the Lord. It's not. And that's why the devil is capitalizing on it and tearing the church apart. And we are all playing to the gallery, acting as victims or acting as if we are advocating for the right thing. Meanwhile, we don't care the damage. Now, see the danger of it. In the next 20 years, in the next 30 years, there are things you can never receive because you belong to one camp. That's the problem that resulted in denominationalism. In the body of Christ today, there is a segment that carry miracle, like it's like cake. And there's another segment that carry holiness, like a garment. But you will see that the segment that has miracle, they are struggling with holy living. The segment that has holiness, they are struggling with sickness. And because they grew up blocking the dimensions that one carry, because the gender of Asia made it that way, now they need it, they can't access it. So on one side, healing is children's bread, but they are struggling with sin. On another side, holiness is the lifestyle, but they are struggling with sickness. That's what will happen to our generation. If we don't begin to correct certain things in maturity and objectively, you will see that a generation will rise 20 years, 30 years. Somebody will die of cancer. Whereas in another context, somebody can just say be healed and is healed. But heritages cannot be transmitted. That's what the devil is striving for. So should we correct? Yes, but there's a biblical pattern. Number three, correct people when they try to sabotage what God is doing through your life. Acts of the Apostles 13, verse 6 to 12. Paul was trying to win the governor, the proconsul. And there was a sorcerer who was trying to stop what Paul was doing. And Paul addressed him. Immediately, he said that the hand of God is upon you. He said, you'll be blind for a season. He said, because you are a son of Satan. And God honored that word. Even in Acts chapter 8, when Peter judged the sorcerer, it was because they were giving the Holy Ghost by laying on the fans. And he came to sabotage what God was doing. He wanted to give money to receive it. And Peter rebuked him publicly. So there's a context. When you read the Bible, although you see correction littered, it doesn't mean there's no context. There's a context. And if we will be accurate, we must also do it according to that context. Number four, basis for bringing correction is when an error is done publicly. When an error is done publicly, you now have the jurisdiction to bring correction. Why? Because everybody will feed from that error. So you are bringing correction now so that you can help those who follow you. So for example, if a prophet shows up and says people should eat grass and they die and governments swing in, I can't close my eyes and say, no, I don't want division. No, the person did the error publicly. So I have jurisdiction to address the matter so that my own disciples too will not assume it's an act of faith and go and eat grass. If a prophet shows up and says women should come and bath naked on the altar, he brings favor. He did it publicly. That means he's sending poison to the body of Christ. With that, I can address it publicly, objectively. Not because I have anything against him, but I can say, listen, this practice is an error. Don't do it. So that another pastor under me will not go and say, oh, he had an encounter and God says you'll bait women on the altar because he thinks it's a practice in the body of Christ. So when you see apostles 
Jesus or correct things in the public is because the error was done in the public. So there was no bitterness. There was no sentiment. There was no competition. It was just a way of sanitizing the body of Christ. And then finally, they brought correction publicly when they are moved by the Holy Spirit. And you will know the Holy Ghost moved them. Because number one, the witness will show. Number two, everybody will discern that no, this thing is God. And it is not happening. It doesn't happen every day. Because there are places you can go to. The situation there is, is a dark situation. And it's a burden in the heart of God. God can move you to address an issue or to judge something. That does not mean it's in your character to start attacking or, you know, being critical about people. That's just the Holy Ghost operation part time. I went to a nation. It was not even in Nigeria. And the Holy Ghost came heavy upon me. And I began to judge falsehood, false prophets, and make some very violent declarations and statements that on a normal day I won't make, you know. But God proved himself. In that meeting, 120 ministers came out and said, we are fake people. We are, some say they are false prophets. Some say they are fake. The video is on the internet. It was in Botswana. We, I say if you are a fake prophet or a false minister, come out. And more than 100 pastors came out. Six of them said they will shut down their church. So you know that, oh, this is not something this guy wants to do. It's a move of the Holy Ghost. I will stand up the next day and do the same thing. It's the Holy Ghost that moved. And there was a witness to that effect. So there is a context. When we are bringing public correction, the people have to be our disciples. Or the people who have to come to our ministries. Or the people who want to, will be people who are trying to truncate what we are doing. Or the people will be people that caused public commotion or, carry, or did an error that is public. Or when the Holy Ghost moves us. And it will show. If you do it like this, trust me, there will never be contention. So when we say unity, it's not like if we, we are saying we should accept everybody who is false. Or we should accept every practice that is false. That's not what we are saying. We are saying in a bid to bring balance and correction, let's not create division in the body of Christ because there are many who have not encountered God. There are many who have not known the love of God. There are many who are not yet mature. And the devil can take advantage of that and create greater problem for the body of Christ. Now, if you have also read your Bible, there are five major things that the apostles, the prophets, and the master corrected. I list them for you quickly as I round up. Number one, they corrected false teachings. Any teaching that is false, they corrected it. Galatians 1 verse 6, Acts 13, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. You see that after Paul taught the grace of God, he says some came and were teaching another doctrine to the church that Paul raised. So Paul stood up and said, if another one, if somebody teaches you another gospel other than what we have taught you, say, let him be accursed. So they addressed falsehood in doctrine. Number two, they addressed deceptive practices like tricks, manipulations. They address them. Acts chapter 8, verse 9 to 24. You see the lady that was carrying the spirit of divination in Acts 16 as well. All of these things are corrected. Any practice that is not of God. You've heard me tell you many times. Somebody comes and stands and says, touch my shoe, drop money, your, your doors will open. That, that's not God. So you correct those things. They are false practices. Like I've mentioned already, go and bathe in the river by 12 midnight to have favor or to get maritally settled. Those are false practices. They corrected such things in the body of Christ and in the scripture. There's a context for it. Number three, subject that was co co corrected, immoral behaviors. When somebody is proven to be involved in immorality, the apostles stood against it firmly. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11 to 13. The church in Corinth had that problem. And again, you will see that this thing follows the principles that I gave you. The church in Corinth was the church Paul was overseeing. He didn't bring that judgment to the church Peter was overseeing. Are you following this? So there must be context so that we don't tamper with the sanity. And then number four, they corrected and stopped people that brought division to the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 from verse 1 to 9. You saw Paul dealing with that issue in the church in Corinth. He said, you are babes, you are carnal. If there is strife amongst you. He said, some of you say, I belong to Paul. Some say, I belong to Apollos. Some say, Cephas. He said, did Paul die for you? Did Apollos die for you? So they corrected anything that promoted division in the body of Christ. And then finally, they also corrected those who made falsehood their lives and refused correction. 2 Peter 2, verse 1 to 3. So when you find these things, there is authority to correct it. If you do it 
according to biblical precision. And if we do it correctly, it will not affect the unity of the body of Christ. Everybody who sees what we do and hear it, there will be a witness of God that this is the mind of the Father. So, nothing wrong with bringing correction, nothing wrong in, in correcting error, correcting falsehood, addressing erroneous practices, doctrines, and all of that, but there must be a context. Because a generation is rising that does not know the word of the Lord and have not met God, but they have risen up in arrogance and they are violating the ancient landmarks. So you see people rise up today, they say they are correcting error, they have the right to do so, and they are insulting fathers and people who are ahead of them. And they think it is consistent with the spirit of Christ. But that's not the way of scripture. First Timothy 5 verse 1 to 2. See what Paul said. He said, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, and he said, the elder women as mothers and the younger as sister with all purity. You see somebody just wakes up and is attacking people that have served God for decades and brought witness to God. Am I saying fathers cannot be wrong? They can be wrong, but there's a context. When your own father is wrong, do you stand up and call for family meeting and carry microphone and start addressing your father? So if you can't do it in your small family, who told you you can come and do it in the body of Christ? And because this is an arrogant generation and we make it look like we are standing on the side of morality and truth and people are endorsing it. And a point comes where heritages cannot be transferred. Meanwhile, the Bible said the older generation shall teach God to the younger generation. Heritages are communicated from one generation to another. And then we allow arrogance and rebellion cut off what God wants to do. This is why we are speaking on the truth, but there's no witness of God. See, today, the testimonies that our fathers had, we have not had them. These men went to cities and whole cities repented. These men worked wonders that we talk about all the revelations, yet we have not seen. Does it not occur to us that even God is afraid of giving us power? Our high-mindedness is too much. Our pride is too much. We talk as if we are the senior brothers of Jesus Christ. And we hope that Jesus will give us power. That's why when we finish preaching all the revelation, nothing happens. We struggle with simple crisis. Even casting out demons, we struggle with it. In this generation, prophets, apostles, pastors, struggle with casting out demons. Struggle with working miracles. Meanwhile, these were things that disciples were doing in the days of the fathers. Does it not suggest to you that God is careful? You need to see the bitterness with which we fight ourselves. Do you think God will risk giving us authority? We will kill ourselves and end the agenda of God. Something is wrong. And it's because we have not understood the body of Christ. We must understand the place of oneness. And again, let me reiterate. Unity is not endorsement of error. It's not endorsement of falsehood. As God helps you in discernment, when you find error, refute it. But at the same time, the quest to bring truth, correction, should not be at the expense of the unity of the faith. There must be a place of maturity, godly character, and consistency and alignment with scriptural injunction that we do these things and our unity is yet Sustain. Thank you for watching this video. We trust you have been tremendously blessed. To get more messages by Apostle Michael Oropo, kindly join our Telegram channel by following the link on your screen. Your life will never remain the same. God bless you.